tents and, and uh, pulling them as it taking actual, in the age of uh, um, uh, additive manufacturing is actually taking uh, digital blueprints and manufacturing river milk products. Uh, the, uh, well, one of the pieces of perspective we're going to hear now is from Paul Syverson, who's uh, the guy who invented core, actually, uh, the, the onion router. Uh, Paul Cyberson, the inventor of the onion router and other technologies, the creator of Tor, author of one of the uh, of books on foundations of logic and over 100 roughly papers. He works for the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory and um, has a, a long history of understanding and thinking about this and with the Tor project, working at the outside levels of what's happening in the online world. Paul Cyberson. Thanks, and uh, I want to thank Gordon for that really great uh, uh, starting off uh, keynote because um, uh, he identified how there's these hard problems that uh, politics doesn't seem to provide an easy answer to. I think part of the answer uh, is, is, uh, is in the technology, not the whole answer, and uh, in fact it's in what uh, I think uh, unfortunately is sometimes called the, the dark web. Um, I invented the dark web, and I'll, I'll get to that, uh, not, not the term, uh, but uh, uh, um, I think the central takeaway that you should get from my talk is that uh, the dot onion domain, onion space, the so-called dark web, uh, is basically now where uh, HTTPS... Microphone? Come a little bit louder. Yeah. Does anybody can't hear me? Can you hear me in the back? Mm. No? Yes. One person said no, one person said yes. This is a problem. All right, I'll get louder. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not good with microphones, okay. but I'm, I'm good getting loud. So uh, anyway, so this is basically where, you know, HTTPS was uh, a decade and a half ago. You know, back then, if you were encrypting your websites, people were like, oh, what do you have to hide? And now, of course, it's recognized as a fundamental enabler of e-commerce. And uh, I think that the protections that are provided by this domain will be recognized in the future as equally important. Now, uh, when we were first coming up with onion routing, we had a bunch of different ideas about why uh, the Navy and the government would be interested in something like this. So I wanted to start off with a motivational use case, one of the types of things we were thinking about. So suppose you have Petty Officer Alice, and she's uh, uh, deployed overseas somewhere, and she wants to go to this website, but it's uh, locked, or it's uh, where she's deployed, or the internet is monitored. So first of all, what's this website? Um, this just, I just picked this as an example. This is the largest employer of former enlisted uh, naval personnel. So you can imagine that this might be uh, a place that uh, Navy people would go to, and you would, it's likely that if she's going there, she's probably somehow associated with the Navy. Now, if it's blocked, obviously that's a problem, but why should we care if, uh, if it's being monitored? Well, let me go back. Uh, whenever you travel overseas for the DOD, you get this training that says things like, don't walk around with a Pentagon baseball cap on or an American flag t-shirt. Somebody might follow you around, see you on the street, go and want to, you know, do you harm and drag you in an alley somewhere. And this is, of course, uh, good advice. So let's assume Alice does that, but now she's uh, back safe in her hotel room and she's gonna go on the internet. And just to underscore that I've been thinking about this for a long time, she has carried overseas with her her 1990s pizza box <laughs> computer and CRT. Um, but, uh, so she's going to this sealiftcommand.com uh, and uh, the people who do the internet services for the hotel can see that she's connected uh, to sealiftcommand.com and uh, exactly when and how long it's going. Now note that even if this is 100% end-to-end encrypted, it's not going to hide the fact that she's going to this site and is therefore probably a Navy person. So, uh, uh, and this, so this is kind of worse than the case of somebody walking along the street and seeing you. It's actually worse than just being at her hotel because it's probably some provider that provides services to half the hotels in town. So somebody can just sit in the middle of town and look and say, oh, this person's probably from the Navy, that person's from Apple, that person's from IBM, because I can see where they're connecting to. And on top of all that, 
uh, the guy who's going to opportunistically just be in the right place to see you going by on the street has to still figure out what he's going to do with that information. He's got to follow you around. Whereas if somebody's associated with her hotel, they probably know exactly what room she's in and what she's checking out. So it's a very easy way to just go and find her and figure out and, and plan uh, how to do her harm. So this is much uh, easier to mount attack with much broader scope than just the you know uh, wearing clothes that uh, make you stand out. And uh, personnel security should be enough of a motivation. But of course, if she's doing uh, work and she's going to different uh, locations uh, and for her purposes of her uh, communication, uh, that's that's a, a concern as well. Uh, with Diffie, one of the inventors of public key crypto, uh, said, oh gosh, uh, dec two decades ago that. Uh, uh, crypt analysis is not the backbone of communications intelligence, it's traffic analysis. And that's the concern we're trying to address. Now, you can use a VPN, but that's only going to be uh, a limited solution because that might hide the particular naval command that she's going to or something. But if it's a VPN that belongs to the Navy, then by merely connecting to it, she's still identifying herself as being part of the Navy. Or if it's a uh, you know, US government VPN. So what we want is a solution that carries traffic for diverse groups of people, people with diverse interests and diverse trusts and diverse ideas of adversaries. Now, we want the solution to be practical, so it's got to be low latency and bidirectional. Um, and as I said, it's got to carry traffic for uh, other than just the Navy. Uh, and it, because it's got to carry traffic for other people, uh, and they have diverse trust. You can't just have a Navy infrastructure and have everybody communicating over that. They're not going to all trust the Navy, and you'll be just back to the original problem of just having Navy people on it. So you have to let other people run parts of the infrastructure. But you also can't just say, here's this blob of binary code. You know, trust us. It's from the Navy. It's great. So you have to make it open source. They have to be able to examine it. It has to be well documented. Tor actually now does deterministic builds. You have to do a lot of things to make sure that, um, that, that they can trust the code that they're running. And because of that, our first publication release for Onion Radical was in 1996. So it's the fundamental of the security design. So the idea then is to have a network of diversely managed relays so there's no single point that can betray Alice. The, the one end can see Alice connecting to, to the network but doesn't know where she's headed. And the other end can see that there's somebody talking to Bob but doesn't know who it is. Um, now, I'm not going to go into detail. Onion routing uh, does this by doing a bunch of crypto and setting up a circuit that hops through the network. And then once it's, it's set up this cryptographic circuit through the network, then, uh, then the data can be passed back and forth uh, between the server and, and Alice. So that's onion routing in a very quick nutshell. Um, so, uh, what does that got to do with this, this Tor thing? Um, so Tor gets used to mean a lot of different things. Uh, uh, it's actually not the onion router, it's the onion routing because uh, somebody who, when he first started working with me on this uh, was explaining that he was working on the original onion routing, not just some of the various imitators that have come along since. And that's where the name came from, the onion routing. Also makes a nice recursive afternoon uh, towards onion routing. Anyway, so this was a class of, uh, of onion routing, a particular design that we came up with as part of one of my projects back uh, around the turn of the millennium. And then uh, after it was moving on from just being a research project and more of a, um, uh, um, a, 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 a you know, something being used uh, uh, in, in actual deployment, uh, it, it, it became a, a US 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, uh, there's a, the Tor project incorporated in 2006. Uh, uh, sometimes we use Tor to refer to the, the client software that runs on Alice's desktop so she can connect to this network. Sometimes we use it to refer to the network uh, itself, which is currently comprised of about uh, 10,000 relays uh, run by volunteers. The Tor project does not run the network at all. Um, uh, scattered around the world, it's currently carrying about 75 gigabits of traffic per second. Um, for about two million daily users, uh, there are all this and all a lot of other stuff is available at the Tor Metrics portal. Um, uh, sometimes we use Tor to refer to this 
uh, you know, community of uh, yurt builders and researchers and developers and operators and trainers, uh, and sometimes some amorphous uh, group of all that. Now, Tor is often called an anonymous communications infrastructure. Uh, I think calling it something that provides anonymity is a little bit of a misnomer, but I accept that that's the shorthand way people refer to it. But in a paper back in 1996, we noted that our goal here is not to be provide anonymity per se, but to separate the identification from the routing. So you go back to my motivational example, uh, Alice wants to make damn sure that it's, you know, her, her Navy command that she's connected to before she hands over her credentials. And likewise, they want to make sure that it's Alice. They don't want to let anybody in there. So this is not just identified, it's authenticated, but not, uh, not by virtue of just the, the bits falling back and forth, going back and forth. Now, um, oftentimes when uh, people get into this space, they always bring up this dichotomy of like how much privacy or privacy and anonymity would you give up for in the sake of providing more security? I have to say that uh, I never quite understood this distinction, but uh, so this is captured nicely by this uh, Pulitzer Prize winning drawing from Clay Bennett. Uh, um, and I understand it from a, a perspective of goal. So, you know, if you're a journalist, you want uh, anonymity for your sources, and if you've got uh, an illness that you're uh, researching, you want privacy, corporations want uh, security for their networks, and the government wants that in spades. And, uh, uh, you know, cops want to have undercover operations. I've talked to a lot of cops where, you know, they use their, their own local machines and then they can't break into gangs and stuff because they're identified right away. So um, they all have these different goals, but from a technological perspective, it's really just the same thing. It's just there's, there's one thing in the middle that does all these separate things. So, yeah, I can, you can separate that out from a policy notion, but on a technological level, talking about this as a uh, security or privacy uh, 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 technology, you know, you call it what you want, I don't care. Now, there are bad guys that use this too, just like they use, you know, cell phones and hammers and automobiles and other stuff. Um, but the difference is they have lots of different other opportunities available to them. In fact, they have things that are harder to detect than Tor because the Tor uh, relays are all, their IP addresses are publicly uh, um, listed in, in, you know, you can look that up. Whereas if they set up stepping stones or a botnet, there's no indication of where they're coming from. Uh, so if you take Tor away, um, they're going to do just fine. It's the, you know, it's the other folks that are not going to have uh, anything. So that's why I say it's, it's kind of all the same thing. So, okay, so that's uh, Tor, but aren't we here to, you know, talk about the dark web? Um, and uh, uh, I'll come to the, like, the, the dot onion stuff in a bit, and I, I, you probably can't see, but uh, I don't know how many people, I, I, I don't know where this iceberg was, but I've seen about a billion different, uh, yeah, that's an overstatement. I've seen a lot of pictures, like, of this exact iceberg with different text around it, and you can see right down here in the deep, dark, bright, deep, for encrypted services, so uh, uh, I'll get to that in a minute, but I want to underscore something which people often miss, which is, is actually the regular surface web, which is the dark and insecure web. I say this for a couple of reasons. First, finding an address, finding out where to go, is itself uh, typically insecure. Uh, DNSSEC has been researched and deployed forever, and uh, it's still only protecting a tiny fraction of 1% of dot-com sites. And every time you add one of these and protect the dot-com site, there's research that shows for every 10 uh, new clients you protect, there's a client which can't handle that, and so you throw them away as a customer. Uh, and then if you can even find out the address, getting there is uh, a problem because uh, your route can be hijacked. So this is a story from 2010 about how China hijacked, uh, uh, presumably, uh, uh, a large chunk of the U.S. government traffic so they could route it all through and, and see um, where all this stuff was coming from and going to because they, they routed it through their, their servers. And this is, a, this is just a graph showing that this is an increasing uh, problem. So even if your stuff isn't being redirected, you also, you don't know uh, 
what, how it's getting where it's supposed to go anyway. Ordinary users have no idea. Now you can run something called the trace route, which will tell you the path to get to the server at the other side. But there's a couple of problems with that. First of all, uh, the forward path and the reverse path are not the same, and usually the other side is not going to run a trace route for you. Um, uh, second of all, there's no guarantee that the path that your trace route took will be the tr path that your traffic takes once it starts going. And uh, perhaps uh, more importantly, ordinary users have no idea what I just said. They don't know what a trace route is. Um, so they're not, that's not, none of this is going to be accessible to, to the regular user. And then uh, uh, lastly, uh, one, if you can you know, look up the address and somehow magically even get there without being attacked, then when you try to get in, that's also not secure because there are, uh, the TLS certificates are subject to, to uh, hijacked and man in the middle attacks. Here's a story from a couple years ago, how a Turkish uh, certification authority, which your browser will totally recognize as a root authority, um, uh, uh, inadvertently basically uh, redirected the certificates from Google. 